Hello everyone and welcome to another Kerbal Space Program adventure and in today's Kerbal Space Program adventure we will be adventuring to the tranquil surface of the Mun. In this, the space plane you are currently watching being constructed. This mission is special because it's going to be a recreation, well actually no not a recreation since it never actually happened, let's say it's an imagining of what a real life planned moon mission uh, that never was. That's right, we'll be flying a Mun return mission in accordance to the US Air Force's Lunex spaceplane design. You see, in the 1960s, it wasn't just NASA trying to come up with a moon rocket design. The Air Force had a crack at one too, and in my opinion, it's a lot more fun than the Apollo approach, since it involves hypersonic spaceplanes, which are always fun. Plus, we get the extra challenge of having to land something back at the Space Center's runway, without engines, mind you, as well, which is a bit more challenging than just land in water like an Apollo mission would be. Anyway, I'll elaborate a little more on what this spacecraft will actually be. The Lunex would have initially been fairly similar to Apollo 11, which is, you know, a massive three-stage rocket that propels a three-man command module into low Earth orbit before proceeding to the moon. However, unlike Apollo 11, the Lunex space plane would have been a direct ascent mission, or direct shot as the Air Force plans described it. A direct ascent mission means that no rendezvous is required at any point of the mission. The ship flies to the moon, lands on it, and flies back, without the added complexity of having to undock and redock a separate command module and lander. Now, it should be noted before someone in the comments mentions it that the initial Apollo concepts were direct ascent too, but these were changed for reasons we can discuss as we conduct our voyage. Right now, we must continue with the construction of our iron chariot. You can see we've switched to the vehicle assembly building so that we can construct the booster that will take this space plane all the way to the MUN. The upper stage consists of three components, one stage to reach the MUN, one stage to decelerate and land on the MUN, and then the final and third stage, this being the space plane itself, will accelerate away from the landing structure and return our Kerbals safely to the Kerbal Space Center. And I'm challenging myself to not use the engine again once we complete our MUN escape burn, so we're going to have to be super careful and uh, fairly precise with our aero brakes to ensure that we'll end up on a flight back to the KSC runway. Now as you can see in this part of the time lapse we've pretty much finished constructing the payload and upper stages of this rocket and all that so we need to get to work building the booster that will get it into space. As per the original Lunex plans we're going to be building a three-stage rocket that will get us into space and it, you know it is a little bit overkill for Kerbal Space Program. This payload could easily be brought into a sub-orbital trajectory with just a single stage or two at the very most, but like I say, in order to be true to the planned rocket, we're going to be using three stages that will get us from the ground and into a circularized orbit. I'm not going to say completely true to the plans though, you know, this space plane itself, you know, it is much grander in scale than the planned rocket was, mainly because the Mark II parts look aesthetically much closer to the planned space plane design, and by having these parts here, we can have more seats available to us than the plans, which were just three seats. We've got enough seats to not only bring Jebediah, Bill and Bob Cullen, but we can also bring Valentina along for the ride with us as well. And there we have it, all completed in its majesty on the pad, ready to launch. Now, of course, I've had to take some uh, artistic liberties with the design of the rocket. Obviously, it never existed, so we don't really know what it would have looked like, but it probably would have looked like this, a tall Saturn V-esque looking rocket, not that this is particularly faithful to the aesthetics of the Saturn V either to be fair, but it would have been, you know, a fairly tall rocket with probably the space plane just sitting there, not encased in any kind of protective payload fairing or anything like that, a little bit similar to the dinosaur concept art that uh, a lot of people may have seen. Anyway, we are well on our way to the upper atmosphere, and as you can see, those vector engines are working overtime with their gimbal. Obviously, this thing doesn't have the best um, controllability during the ascent because of all the control surfaces right at the front of the rocket. This thing is exceptionally flip-happy. I was very close to putting a fairing on the end just to make it a little bit easier to fly, but luckily, you know, we've added those fins at the back, we've got the vector engines which have colossal gimbal range, so it is able to you know, fly without flipping if you're careful, but that's why you can see those rocket engine, or well, the rocket exhaust, I say, is just uh, whizzing, like flipping about up, down, left, right, just fighting to keep this rocket on course. Oh, nearly flipped up as we detached that lower stage. Now we're using a skipper engine just to coast our way into orbit. The skipper engine is, you know, much more efficient than the vectors, but it's not as powerful and it doesn't have that insane gimbal range, so it is going to be harder to control this thing if it starts to flip, but again, luckily, now we're exiting the denser parts of the atmosphere. Anything like imbalances with the control surfaces is going to be far less 
uh, invasive to the flight path than it was earlier. And look at that, we've nearly exhausted all of the fuel of this stage. I don't know how well you guys could see it, but we've got all of our orbital information on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. And in 3, 2, 1, now our apoapsis is just above the Kármán line of 70 kilometers above Kerbin surface. So we are definitely going to be entering space, but now we need to think about, you know, how we're going to stay in space. Now, I've had a fairly flat ascent profile towards the end stages of that burn, so we haven't got too much work to do to raise our periapsis above the atmospheric line and make sure we, you know, stay in orbit. So it's going to be a quick 135.5, oh, now it's 0.6, now it's 0.5, wow, crazy. <laughs> a meter per second burn, I don't know what that was. Uh, and then we can think about plotting a course for the Mun. I've kind of designed this rocket so that stages deplete in such a position where they're not going to leave debris stuck in space. So obviously, we detached the skipper stage before we reached orbit, so that stage will just crash back down to Kerbin. This stage, obviously, we're now in orbit, but I'm going to detach it once we're on a course to the Mun. And I'm going to set our initial course toward the Mun as, you know, a collision course, so that when we detach that engine, it's going to crash harmlessly into the surface. Uh, obviously, before we get to the Mun, we'll do a quick correction burn so we don't meet a similar fate, and that's just how I'm going to try and avoid leaving debris in space. I guess an exception to this would be the actual landing legs of the rocket itself. They're going to be left on the Mun, but, you know, they're not clutter. It's quite a nice little landmark to visit, a historic site for future generations to visit, so I've not got a problem with leaving that structure on the surface of the Mun. Now, I feel like at some point in this video, I should probably address the uh, elephant in the room for some people, and that is, I have actually done this mission before on this channel. I have done a Lunex mission, but a number of years have passed since I made that video. I feel as a player, I am better at Kerbal Space Program. And looking back, you know, that ship was so janky looking, like it didn't look very, very, like it didn't look faithful at all to the actual Lunex design, you know, the lander design for the Lunex project. So, ooh, it's a very glitchy money counter just there. Uh, this one looks far more accurate, and I think it's a much more aesthetically pleasing lander. Like, we've got those fairing pieces, those structural pieces. The other lander, it was just a bit of a mess. I'm not putting a picture of it on screen, because quite frankly, I want this to be considered as, you know, my contribution to Lunex recreations now. I'll let that video stay for the legacy of it, but uh, this is now my, my, my official Matt Lowne Lunex recreation. As we begin our drop down to the Mun. And of course, this being a direct shot mission to the Mun, we're not going to be, you know, detaching anything. We're just going to decelerate and then immediately begin the landing. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but didn't go into it in too much detail, the advantages and disadvantages of a direct ascent mission, because whilst a lot of people aren't familiar with the phrase direct ascent, it is generally how most people do their first Minmus and Mun landings, because it is much, much easier. And in Kerbal Space Program, it's probably the more sensible approach. But in real life, there are a number of reasons why it wouldn't be appropriate. Now, the obvious advantage, you know, of a direct ascent mission is that it's far simpler than docking two ships, especially at a time, you know, in the 1960s, computers aren't very good, computer guidance is going to be very difficult, and there wasn't much human experience in orbital rendezvous at all. However, direct ascent missions do come with one big caveat, and that's the mass required. The mass required to do a direct ascent moon mission is much, much greater than the lunar orbit rendezvous approach. The Saturn V, which I think we can all agree was a very big rocket, and it was the rocket that ultimately took us to the moon, would never have been capable of hauling such a massive payload into orbit. It would have been very, very difficult to build a bigger rocket than the Saturn V at the time due to, you know, the lack of factories big enough to construct the fuselage. And believe me, that was actually one of the big issues with the Saturn C8, the proposed bigger brother of the Saturn V. There were just not enough facilities that were big enough to build the fuel tanks. The Saturn C8 is actually interesting. I did a video on it, but it got copyright claimed by Sony, and so I feel like I shouldn't link it. But that that is another mission I would I have been kind of keen to revisit. Now I actually have a reason to revisit it. So there we are. I mean, there's there's plenty of really really interesting alternate history moon missions to uh, look into. If there's any you guys would really like to see, or if you've got a personal favorite alternate history moon landing mission that you'd like to see, then do let me know. The Lunex is definitely one of my favourite alternate history moon landings. I think the other one would... moon landings? Alternate history moon landings. I also really like the Soviet N1 rocket as well, just because I love the, you know, Soviet space aesthetics. Something cool like that, but I've done, I've done M1s, and now I've officially done Lunex. 
Uh, I've done Apollo. Every, every KSB YouTuber has probably got a plethora of Apollo <laughs> recreations at this point. But, you know, if there are any others that I've not covered or, you know, I haven't covered in a number of years and maybe I would be better at, re at um, recreating it now, then do let me know in the comments below. That's, uh, that's going to be the theme of the comments, maybe, hopefully. I have no idea. <laughs> what I do know is that we've been touched down on the mun for quite some time. We've done all of our science experiments, but now we need to uh, pose for our photos with the flag. It's uh, one small waddle for Kerbal, but one giant stumble for Kerbal Kind as Valentina goes to join Bob Kerman on EVA. Jebediah and Bill are staying in the cockpit of the space plane just to keep all of the systems you know, primed and ready for departure, but we've got plenty of time for Valentina and Bob to do a quick EVA, collect all the data from the science experiments because we will not be taking the lander back with us, and then they can re-embark the craft. We didn't really need those ladders, but I liked the way they, you know, are. <laughs> I liked how they, how they look on this craft. Um, there's also good, I guess, if we somehow used up all of our EVA propellant, we still have the means of getting back onto the space plane. But, you know, that's that's that. I mean, I guess if you wanted to take this space plane somewhere else uh, where jetpacks wouldn't work, like Lathe, first of all, you probably wouldn't get very far when you try and leave, but, you know, you could still at least uh, disembark and re-embark the spacecraft okay. So, you know, quick report. Jebediah and Bill are checking their systems out. All of the passengers are ready. Nothing more to do other than shut down the landing engine for the final time and then get ready to hit the stage button which will fire the engine, remove the fairing and unhook the decoupler. And there we are, look at that. So you can start flying flat pretty much immediately. We are using the Cheetah engine which is not a very powerful engine but for a craft this size it does provide pretty good TWR and it's very efficient in vacuum flight as well. We have more than enough Delta V to get back to Kerbin, but you know, it's nice to have the wiggle room if we need to make any adjustments to our orbit, which I know I vowed not to do once we've done our MUN escape, but you might not want to impose such arbitrary restrictions on yourself. It is nice to have a little bit more fuel than you need so you can make any corrections. This craft is available to download in the description if you'd like to give this mission a go yourself, but I do like to encourage people to maybe try building the crafts either from the time lapse or making their own crafts, just because that makes you better. It makes you a better player of Kerbal Space Program. Anyway, oh, it looks kind of... Uh, it didn't look quite as stumpy when it was attached to the rest of the rocket. I guess because it literally wasn't, because it was attached to the rest of the rocket. But even so, you wouldn't have thought it would be as stumpy as it looks. I mean, this, is, this is just me. I, I could be way off. Maybe you guys could anticipate it looking this way, because you could see it. I don't know. I'm really stalling for time for this part here. We're going to create our final maneuver nodes just to get ourselves on an equatorial orbit. I don't want to make things too difficult for myself, so I'm going for equatorial because... The Kerbal Space Center lies on the equator. And then we're going to set our periapsis. I think I, I can't remember what the maneuver node said now, but I think my eventual periapsis was about 33 kilometers above the surface. So well within the atmosphere, so we could do some aero braking. At the moment, all of the control surfaces are deactivated, mostly for the aesthetics in vacuum flight and also to help control the rockets during our initial ascent. But now we will need them, so we can't forget to activate them before we hit the atmosphere, which I guess I did. I need to quickly reactivate them now. I have got a couple of cheeky elevons clipped into the cockpit just because, you know, the actual Lunex mission was supposed to be a lifting body craft and lifting bodies don't work that well in Kerbal Space Program. The Mark II space plane parts actually are lifting bodies. They do provide some lift, but it wasn't really enough for me to be able to control this thing particularly well in flight. It does actually work without those elevons clipped into the cockpit, but it doesn't work quite as well. It flies a lot better with them clipped in. So apologies, it does work without them, but you know, it, it just works a little bit better with them. Anyway, you may have noticed the Kerbal Space Center occasionally materializing below us during our aero breaks. So I knew that actually the runway would be fairly close to our periapsis on the next pass through. Now, this part of my flight is not that faithful to the original Lunex plan. It probably wouldn't have done multiple aero brake passes like this. One of the main reasons for this is because if left in too eccentric of an orbit, the astronauts may have been exposed to excessive radiation in the Van Allen belts before the next re-entry opportunity arose. So, you know, I think in order to minimize the amount of heat we're exposing to the craft, and I guess the G-forces on our Kerbals as well, this, um, this series of aero brakes was a good choice for me and also it enabled us to fine tune our final approach and make sure we were going to be definitely getting close well we were definitely going to be getting to the Kerbal Space Center's runway and speaking of there it is so my Lunex recreation 
is coming to a close. So I hope you guys enjoyed, and you know, just in case someone's going to point it out in the comments, me referring to this mission as a Lunex recreation may not be entirely representative of the scale of the proposed design. What I'm recreating here is the initial phase of the Lunix project, that being the lunar landing and return craft itself. The ultimate timeline of Project Lunix would actually have concluded with a 21-person underground air force base on the moon by 1968 at a total cost of 7.5 billion dollars which we're clocking at just under 65 billion dollars in today's currency if my if my uh, calculations are correct but here at Lan Aerospace you know money is no object so maybe it's something to consider in the future underground structures in Kerbal Space Program right now are quite difficult maybe in the sequel that won't be the case however all of that is things to consider in the future right now you gotta think about something else to watch. Maybe the video on the left, which was chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithms. On the right-hand side is my most recent upload. There's also a link to subscribe and check out Patreon if you'd like to. And you'll find links to various social media, including Discord and Twitter, in the description. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.